some servants are coming down, but um, we'll get started, so if we're not running too late. Um, we thought today we'll talk about the topic of, of faith, um, and I was, I I was thinking that because, um, you. you know, we, we fast for 43 days, and the 40 days is obviously for the preparation for the nativity, but the, the three days is is the, the moving of the mountain, which is related to faith and the and the verse which, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move, and it'll be moved. So we're not going to talk about that um, story or that miracle today, but we just want to talk about that faith because that faith is really central to what we do, right? We, we're teaching that faith, but not only teaching, it's not textbook teaching because they can learn it from anywhere, but we're delivering a living faith. This living faith that we deliver through God's work will produce saints and martyrs and, and nuns and monks and bishops and, and priests and, and we'll, we'll bless the world, okay? So we're, we're delivering this living faith. So it's this living faith that we want to speak about. And I know Phoebe is very excited to speak to you about faith. She, she really is. She told me. <laughs> so so Hello, I'll everyone. hand over to Phoebe. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Abuna, can you, Bismil Ab, please? Abuna? Buna, Bismillah, Ab, please. Okay. Thank you, Shabelle, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for having me today. Um, so, Shabelle brought us in on a very positive note and explained why he chose this topic today. And before you all turn off, it's not a Sunday school sermon, I promise, lesson. It's not a sermon today. I'm hoping today... You can't hear me? Seriously? My voice is always so loud. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping we're actually going to do something different today. But before we get to something different, he, uh, Shabelle, started with a very uplifting thing. Right? So... I'm just going to read because it's a very long lesson and I have to pick, uh, pick bits and pieces from it. I do have copies of my lesson, so exactly what I've got in here, you'll get a copy today if you want it. So, conscious of the time, I apologise for reading, but I just need to read. So, going on from what Chabelle said, faith is, is so important. And St. Paul, of course, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he tells us the three pillars we need are faith, hope and love, and Christ himself spoke about faith and its importance in many, many um, stories. So, um, it's, a, it's, it's something we really need to think about, and it is a very much a very um, much spoken about topic in Sunday school and in the sermons in the Mass, but today we just want to look at it from being a servant. I need... I'm going to just ask you a series of questions. And yes, they are tough. And the good thing is I don't know most of you. I've never served with any of you. So it's not like I, I'm directing this at anybody, okay? These are questions I ask of myself and I want to ask them of you as well. So the scary thing is that as servants, it is vital that we are fully aware of what we believe and for what we stand the thing is that service doesn't guarantee a sound faith. Reading the Bible doesn't guarantee complete belief in the words that are contained within the Bible. And attending church doesn't guarantee we will be strong, steadfast Christians. Yes, we have to do those things, absolutely. They, they are what help us get to the faith, but they don't guarantee anything. The reality is that each of us must... must reach our faith through self-examination and tough questions, and most importantly, building an abiding and strong relationship with God. No one can make you get to there. You have to get there yourself, okay? I, I find sometimes we don't want to hear that because it puts the whole responsibility back on us, but unfortunately, that's the case. And service is not a protection that will guarantee anything. As servants, we have to work much harder at these things to ensure because we are looked at as examples 
okay? Whether we like it or not, that's part and parcel of the glory of service, okay? And it is extremely glorious to serve. Okay, so here's some tough questions I'm just going to read. And all you need to do is take them away. And if you don't absorb them all, that's fine. You can take a copy of the talk and ask yourself, who am I? How would I describe myself? This is what you need to ask yourself. What do I think are the most important facts about me that I would share with anyone? Because those sorts of things are actually quite telling as to who we actually believe we are. Okay? Um, what do I believe in and what do I stand for? Do I even have an opinion about what is happening around me or do I sit on the fence? Am I swayed by the tide of popular opinion because I don't want to stand out because it's easier? And at the moment, we're being attacked in the world with the weirdest ideologies and the weirdest ideas. And the thing is, once they keep in our faces, in our faces, in our faces, there is a fear we become desensitised to what is right and wrong. So that's why it's important to constantly question yourself. What do I believe in? What do I really think is the truth? Okay? And you know what the answers are. These are I'm not asking you anything that is new. There's no reveal today. There's no fantastic question with a, oh, wow, I'd never thought of that. No. Everything I'm telling you now is something you know, but sometimes it's good for us to be reminded every now and then. Okay. My questions do get harder as I go around, as I go down. So... Do I really believe in God? You might be thinking, I'm a Christian, of course I do, but I want you to think about that question. Do I really believe in God? Do I truly believe in the teachings of the Bible about God, about his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence? In other words, he's, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and, and eternal, all-present. Do I believe in his unwavering love for me? that he has my best interests in his heart. Do I even matter to God? Do I believe the promises and teachings of the Bible? And is the Bible in its current form compatible with the world today? Is it relevant? Do I really believe? Now, if, you, if those questions give you any doubt, that's okay. It's all right to doubt. It's all right to question, okay? There's a man in the Bible, Christ was helping him, and he said, I really want to believe, help my unbelief. It's okay to scream out to God and say, help my unbelief. But you really, really need to think about what you actually believe in, especially in today's world, as I said, where we're being attacked left, right, and center with the weirdest ideas and the weirdest ideologies, okay? Now, as servants, if you don't know the answers to these questions and if you can't face them head on, then the kids we serve will see through us and we weaken the faith to them. Unfortunately, yes, there is a consequence. If you're doubting, the kids will notice that. If you're teaching the kids something and you don't fully 100% believe that, the kids will notice, okay? And what are you leaving, what image are you leaving them with? Um, look... I think back on my days in Sunday school and I couldn't tell you any stories that the servant taught me. I couldn't tell you anything I learned, but I know what it left me feeling. I know that I felt loved by my servants. I know that I felt that they cared. I know that I felt that they believed what they were teaching. And it, it does affect you. That's, the, that's what we leave with the kids. Our faith, that's what we leave with the kids. It shines through the way we talk to them, the way we act with them, that faith. So unless you know the answers to these questions, you have to then question for yourself what is shining through to the kids, okay? I know I'm sounding very negative and I apologise, but I feel as servants we sometimes need a bit of a wake-up. I'm sorry, okay? And uh, I often get asked to do these talks because I will face this stuff head on. I'm not, okay, so... But I promise you that our talk will finish on a really amazing note. Okay, so let's, that's why I wanted to get all this stuff out of the way first. Okay. Now, so 
what is it to be a Christian of faith? What are the characteristics of this faith? Faith. Now, I'm going to say something that a lot of people would never say, but I hope you take it in the tone it's intended. The Synexarium is full of stories of faithful heroism and, and strength and, of course, amazing miracles. But unfortunately, what's happened in today's world that really worries me is we've reduced the Synexarium to a bunch of miracles and we forget the, the real fight and the real faith that is shown in the stories. So let's take, for example, St. George, because he's, I love St. George, he's my favourite, right? I know I pray in St. Mina's church, but I just love St. George. Um, we all know, if you ask anyone about St. George, what's the first thing I'm going to tell you? He was given a cup of poison, he did the sign of the cross on it and drank it and lived to tell the tale. That's the first thing we all know. But we all forget that he was tortured for seven years. We don't want to worry about that part. And in that seven years, and in his doxology, we start seven years. We start with it. Shashvan Rompi, right? We start with that in his doxology. So he was tortured for seven years. And yes, he drank the cup of poison. But at the end of, the, at the end of it, God didn't go, good on you, mate. You get to live a very long and happy life. No. In the end, he still lost his life. But we ignore those things. And unfortunate, and I blame this focus on the, on the miracles of the Synexarium, too much focus, I think, because then, unfortunately, those things creep into our lives and we think, well, if I have a problem and it's not resolved in the same way St. George's problem was resolved, then I lose my faith really quickly. But we don't focus on the fact that I need to be like him. He suffered for seven years and didn't lose his faith and didn't question with God and didn't say to God, take that faith, take this um, suffering from me. And he continued. And then when he was killed anyway, he didn't complain, he was joyous. So that's the kind of Christian faith we need. That needs to shine through in everything we do as servants. That's the faith we're leading to. And when we question what we really believe, it's not until we question and address our weaknesses, until we do that, then we can't achieve that kind of faith. You know, um, I get in trouble with a lot of people because, you know, people, when they're sick, the first thing they want you to say is, may God heal you. Or I go to God with a problem. I go, God... My so-and-so person who's very dear to me is sick. Please heal them. So we go to God with, with the problem and the solution that we're expecting. And if he doesn't, you know, do what we want, when we snap our fingers, then we, we don't believe in him. Instead of just saying, God, here's the problem. Please do what is right for you. And I get in trouble because when people tell me, I just go, may God do what's best for you. I never say, may God heal you because I don't know what's best for that person. But people get upset, and I know that, but that's fine. Because true faith has to rely on the fact that what God is doing is going to be the best thing for us, whatever that is. And if he allows illness, so be it. If he allows death, so be it. Um, if he allows, um, you know, being fired from a job, so be it. So long as we believe at every step of the way that God is We've left it in his hands and we have the complete faith that he will do what we want, then that faith will shine through to our kids, okay? So, enough of the negativity. That's it, okay? I just wanted you to take away that and think about it. And by the way, uh, just one more thing. Having faith doesn't mean that we're going to have a free pass in the world. In fact, the bigger our faith, Anyone here done physics, has studied physics? I hated physics at school, never understood it. But the only thing I understood in physics was balance, okay? So you put a, a weight on this side of a seesaw. Remember the seesaw in, in the playground? You need to have the same weight on the other side. One of my favourite scenes in Kindergarten Cop is having Arnold Schwarzenegger sitting on one side of the seesaw with about five kids on the other side to, to make up his weight. Otherwise, if you don't, you have one up and the other one down. So, the bigger the faith, because it's so glorious, the more the tribulation, because there has to be balance. And if there isn't, then I'd be going to God and knocking and saying, hello, what's going on? Why is everything going so smoothly? 
Am I, have I not got enough faith? Do you not trust me with more? Imagine doing that. Try it. But be ready. Be ready, okay? Um, this is a big ask, but this is what we're heading towards as, as servants. We need to be that higher level. It's a fact of life, okay? We need to be at that higher level. We need to be the example because we get a lot of blessings from serving. The blessing we get from talking about God, what more can we say? There was a bishop, I was very young to remember him. His name is Ambar Rossum, but my mum and dad have always made sure my brother knew this story. He used to go to people and in his sermons, this was back in the 70s, so before most of you were born, right? So he would go to, uh, in his sermons and he'd say, if you want to gossip, by all means, gossip as much as you like, but gossip about God only. So in your day, sit and you want to talk about someone? You want to say things about people? Say it about God. Don't gossip about human beings because they're boring. Gossip about God. So I, I, that's really stayed with me and I, I really love it. Okay. So now, um, Shabelle mentioned the mustard seed. So I just want to say one thing about it. The mustard tree, I didn't know this until I had to prepare for this lesson because I've always wondered why Christ talked about the mustard seed and we all know from Sunday school that the mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds of all the plants. Great. But one thing I didn't know, and I'm hoping that some of you might go, oh, I didn't know that either, is that that tiny, tiny seed can grow into a tree that's about six metres high and about six metres wide. Okay, so from that tiny, tiny tree, like Christ doesn't say things willy-nilly. He's not, he knows what he's doing, right? So if he's chosen the mustard seed, there's a reason, okay? And as I said, we hear the stories all the time, so I'm not telling you anything you didn't know, but I loved the fact, and when I was preparing uh, for this lesson, one of the things that I read that I loved so much was one of the, the, the comment, commentaries said, from this tiny, tiny seed grows this huge tree. So they were talking in American, so they said about 20 feet high and about and almost 20 feet as wide. So in our language, that's over six metres high. So if you want to know, six metres would be to the roof, okay? So think about it. Your house is about just... To, I like everything to come in perspective. I'm, I'm very factual. So your house is probably about two and a half metres to the ceiling... Okay, so it's, it's a two-storey house plus some and then some, right? So that's about the ceiling up here. So can you imagine from this tiny seed grows a tree that high and almost that wide? So it would basically fill this church here, okay? And the commentator said, and in it, birds find a lot of branches to form their nests and, um, and it acts as... Um, a protection for a lot of bird life. So not so this tiny seed, from it comes a lot of fruit, but also that fruit, that tree, acts as a protector for many, many bird, life, bird species. So when our faith, that tiny, tiny faith as a mustard seed grows, not only do we produce more fruit, but we also help to embrace others within our faith. We are protectors for others. Wow. I was, that blew me away. So that's the most sermon part you'll get today. Okay. We're going to move on to a different story. Um, so in the Synoptic Gospels, which are, of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, often not many stories are mentioned in all three Synoptic Gospels. But this particular story was... And, of course, it's the story of Jairus who had the 12-year-old daughter who was dying. And he came to Christ and said, can you heal her? And then along the way, he was stopped by the lady who was hemorrhaging or bleeding for 12 years. And she got healed. And then he continued on to Jairus's house. And uh, by that stage, his daughter had died. And then he ra- it ended up being a raising from the dead. Okay, so just to... Uh, refresh your memory. I want to make sure you're, you're all on the same page with me. I'm going to read the account from Luke. If anyone wants to follow, I'm reading from Luke 8, verses 40 to 56. So I'm going to read it very quickly. Please pay attention to the story. 
So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now, a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, 12-year-old daughter, 12-year blood flow. Nothing's just together um, by chance, okay? Um, So, a woman, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that he was not that she was not hidden she came trembling and falling down before him she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately and he said to her daughter be of good cheer your faith has made you well go in peace while he was still speaking someone came f- from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him your daughter is dead Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. When he came, this is Christ, when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James and John and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, do not weep, she is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned and she arose immediately and he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Okay, that's our story. I was in a real dilemma. Do I go through this story because there was so much to tell you about it? Or do I go a different path and I chose a different path? Okay, so I'm going to leave you to go online and Google commentary on this section and have your mind blown away by some of the insights that some of our church fathers say about this, about this story, okay? I, I was blown away. I honestly could not contain the story within the talk today, that I couldn't contain it. So um, I apologise, but we are going to move on um, from discussing the actual story. I just want to say a couple of things about Jairus and the lady and then we'll, um, we'll bring it together. So, Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. So, what does that actually mean? You've got to understand that um, the Jews used to only have a temple, one temple in Jerusalem. But as they started to move, just like, think of us, we left Egypt, Sudan, uh, whatever other country we've come from, and we've come to these other countries into the diaspora, So we started to build churches. Now, they couldn't build temples, so they were permitted to build synagogues. And they were places where they could meet to uh, discuss the scripture and give their offerings, okay? But it didn't replace the temple. So Jairus was a ruler of one of these synagogues, and as best I could describe it, it'd be like saying a priest or a bishop today, okay, In in the synagogue. But a person who was considered... Um... Uh, a spiritual authority, okay? So this was a person who knew the law, just like we would expect a Buna to know the Bible and we ask him questions about the Bible and he would know the answers. The rule of the synagogue was expected to know the same. So this was a person of authority, okay? We read over that, the rule of the synagogue, blah, 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 blah. We ignore it, but this was a person of authority and this is very important, has a lot of meaning, okay? So... <clears throat> Now, St. Cyril of Alexandria reminds us of something from this story. So there's a couple of things I want to tell you from this story to make it have a bit bit more meaning. St. Cyril of Alexandria, who's, of course, our wonderful St. Cyril I, the pillar of faith, um, which our small church is named after, reminds us that in the Jewish faith, they were strictly forbidden to bow or fall down at anyone's feet 
because this was an act reserved for God. Now, think of think Abuna, right? This is Abuna who knows the law, okay? And he knew what was right or wrong. So they were strictly forbidden to fall down. So for Jairus to do this would have been a conflict of interest for him. As someone who was supposed to uphold the law, he was breaking it because it meant he was acknowledging Christ as God. He was doing to a human being what is reserved for God. So that was big. See, we read this, that he fell down at Christ's feet, but we don't realise that this was the ruler of the synagogue, not just some poor, uneducated person. So this was big, okay? This shows his faith, a faith that goes against everything, okay? Our faith has to be stronger than anything, anything around us, okay? Also, what he asked Christ to do to heal his daughter, to raise her from the dead, that was something that was only reserved for God as well, okay? So he was further confirming his views about Christ, that he was God. Also, Jairus was taking a big personal um, uh, expense on himself because by doing these actions, he was actually exposing himself to being expelled by the synagogue because he was breaking the law, okay? He was breaking the law. It's as simple as that. And he was doing something very grievous and very, very bad in the Jewish faith. But he didn't care. His faith was beyond any of that. He wasn't afraid of the personal um, harm that would come to his way. That's a really deep level of faith. The faith that is not afraid of personal harm. How many of us can honestly put our hands up and say, we could do the same? I know I can't. I don't know. I don't want God to test me. I'm scared, okay? But we do know 21 men who did get tested, right? Those Libyan martyrs blow my mind away because to me, they did exactly that. They put themselves in physical harm and had their faith tested and passed with glorious, glorious rewards, okay? Okay? So I ask you, if we were one of those people, would we have passed that test? It's a tough question, I know, but I'm a person of tough questions. We have to be, okay? All right. Now, just about the lady. So I've spoken about Jairus, about the lady with the 12-year hemorrhage. She's my favourite person. I love her. So I was so happy to talk about her today. Because if you understand her life, you'd understand why, okay? Okay. So the blokes here, I know you're not going to get the whole bleeding thing. I get that. And the girls might understand it a bit better. But just imagine you've got an ailment, whatever that ailment is, and you've had it for 12 years and the doctors can't help you. And not only that, the Bible tells us they made her worse. Okay? And I can tell you now, if you're bleeding for 12 years from anywhere, like even if you just have an open wound, that's going to have consequences. I'm not a doctor, but common sense tells me She was probably anemic. She was probably having dizzy spells all the time. Uh, She was unsanitary. I mean, can you imagine without the modern conveniences we have today, back in that time with no running water, no proper medication, can you imagine what this woman was going through? Just put yourself in her shoes for a minute. She was not living a pleasant life. She was lonely. She was ostracised from her society. And not just that, in the Jewish culture, people who bleed... Anyone, male or female, but the women were always picked on more. And no, I'm not being a feminist. I'm just talking about, that's what I mean about, I don't, I get scared to say these things because these are facts that we need to know. There is different understandings of things in the Bible. That's fine. The women were treated differently because of their menstrual cycle. That's just a fact of life. It's not picking on anything. And just to let you know, it was actually for their protection, Because the women didn't have proper sanitary um, conveniences, this is just an aside, by the way, it's not part of my story, but I I always say it, they were actually asked to be kind of put aside because they could rest. There was no Panadol they could take for the pain. There was no um, running water to keep themselves clean, okay? So they were asked not to do anything. Who wants anything more than that? 
Can you imagine if every time today a woman gets her menstrual cycle, they say to her, you don't have to go to work, you don't have to cook, you don't have to clean, you don't have to do anything. Just sit quietly in a corner and everybody else will look after you and look after your family. That's not a bad deal. But unfortunately, we forget why God put these rules in place and people who have ulterior agendas go and say, see, women were treated as second-rate citizens in the Bible. It's a load of garbage. Okay, and as a female, I can say that with confidence. God did not treat us as second citizens at any time. Okay, and we could have many talks on that. Okay, and I know if any man got up and said that, you'd all roll your eyes at him, but that's why I take, make the point of saying it for you. Okay, so this woman was considered defiled. Yes, it's tough language because people were in an unsanitary life. So you don't want to get you don't want to catch whatever she's got. I mean, look at the way we're behaving now with the last couple of years of COVID. The minute someone sneezes, everyone like wants to run for the hills, right? We've, we've inherited the same mentality. We've gone the same psycho. So you understand it. You understand what she was going through. It was exactly the same. Think COVID, but this time it was just her blood flow. That's it, okay? So, sorry, I took a commercial break there, but I think it was important to understand that this is not picking on her as a woman at any time. It was anyone who had a blood flow, was considered defiled, and they weren't allowed to be among society. So she was taking a huge risk in coming out, and she would have had a big cloak on with a face covered as much as possible. And, you know, just think today with all our mask wearing and everything, we're all afraid, and if we have a little sniffle, we're scared. She was the same. Because not only that, she would have been publicly humiliated, and this happened... In the last two years, people were publicly humiliated. Um, she would have been punished and people would have just run screaming from her. Okay, so for her to come, she'd heard about Christ and she had faith that he would heal her. We don't know how she had that faith. The Bible doesn't divulge that, but the fact is that she did. All right, so she comes along and she says... I don't actually even need to touch him. I just need to touch the, the tip of his garment. Wow, that's deep. I don't need to touch him. I just need to touch the tip of his garment because his garment's touching him and that's enough for me and that will heal me. That's, that's pretty big. That's a special kind of faith. Think on that for a minute. Okay, her plan was to make a quick, to get a quick healing, touch, run before anyone notices, and she even thought Christ was not going to notice. But the reason I mention this is because I loved something St. John Chrysostom wrote about this. He asks the question, why did Christ call out this woman? Why did he, he knew what she was doing. He knew she was afraid. But why did he make her come to the public eye and be noticed by everybody? Was he being cruel? St. John Chrysostom asks that question. And I love that. When you read um, the commentaries of the fathers, they often do that. They'll ask a question and then answer the question. I love that. So it makes you realise they don't just take the story at face value. They actually go in and nitty-gritty. And that makes it easier for us because then we don't need to worry. We can just go and read their commentary and learn. I love that. So what does he say? He says, Christ did not let the lady, I'm just going to read it, remain hidden by calling her out. This achieved four things. One, it put an end to the woman's fear that she had stolen the gift, so she'd stolen the healing, but would have remained in agony of conscience. I love that word. In other words, she would have been still distressed because she knows by touching him, she would make him defiled. So she'd achieved healing, but in the process, she would feel guilty because she's dirtied Christ. Okay, so Christ wanted to say to her, nothing can dirty me, nothing. And this is really important, we forget this lesson. No matter how ugly our sin is, we can't make Christ ugly. We can't dirty Christ. So come to him at all times. Come and touch the hem of his garment. Number two, um, Christ let her know in no uncertain terms that he knew what she was doing even though she was hidden. Christ had to let everyone know that he's aware of everything because he's God. Number three, Christ exhibited her faith to everyone. 
so they could emulate her or copy her. The word emulate means to copy her. That's a woman we're talking about. For all those people who try and convince us that God treats women second, second class citizens, no, he doesn't. He used a woman to show us how strong faith could be. And number four, through her courage, I love this one, Christ encouraged Jairus, who was about to lose his faith, that Jesus could help him. Remember when they came and told him, don't, don't bother Christ because um, the girl's dead? What did Christ say? Just believe and everything will be fine. So he had just witnessed this miracle, Jairus. So St. John Chrysostom, see, see, one miracle is helping another. One, one, one faith, remember the tree, is a protection and gives life to the bird life. So one faith helped the faith of another person. See, is it coming together? Are you, are you seeing it? Are you seeing the connections? I hope so. Anyway, because I was overexcited and I I get so excited and then, you know, anyway. All right. Then I have a section here about what is true faith, which you can all read. But um, I want to read you, sorry, before the last bit. So three points from three fathers about Jairus and the lady. So St. John Chrysostom says, he compared the woman to the synagogue ruler. Okay. He says, The synagogue ruler was a well-known public figure and the woman an outcast. However, do you see, this is his words, not mine. However, do you see the superiority of the woman to the ruler of the synagogue? Now listen to this. I'd never thought about this until I read this. She did not detain Christ, like she didn't hold him. If I detained someone, I would grab them by the arm and hold them. But Jairus required his presence. Jairus didn't say, just speak and she'll be healed. He said, come to my house. But she didn't do that. She came and just said, I don't don't even want to talk to him. Um, She did not detain Christ, but Jairus required his presence. She took no hold of Christ, no hold, but only touched his garment. But Jairus required the laying on of his hand. He wanted him to come into his house and lay his hand on the daughter. Even though she came later, she was the first to go away healed. Okay? So she was rewarded. So Jairus came first. Then she came. He healed her first. Then he went in and healed, helped Jairus. Okay? Our faith makes a difference. All right. That was St. John Chrysostom. He, if you... His commentary is amazing at breaking down stories like this. So if you ever have a section that you don't understand, I recommend you go read what he has because he's very practical in his, um, in his commentaries. So in Cyril of Alexandria, our lovely, lovely saint, says the lady was possibly encouraged when she saw Christ heading to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. And at the same time, Jairus was encouraged when he saw Christ do what seemed like the impossible when he healed the woman from her blood flow. The faith of each was strengthened by the other. Okay? And St. Ambrose, I love St. Ambrose. Now, he goes on a different path and he says, at first consider this. Before resurrecting a dead person to produce faith, he began by healing a hemorrhage or a bleeding, okay? In the same way, we celebrate the historical resurrection during the Passion of the Lord so that we can believe the eternal resurrection at the second coming, okay? And a sterile Elizabeth gives birth before Mary gives birth to a child, so we can believe that a child will conceive. I love how he just brings the three stories together. This is, this is the kind of depth that we all need to aspire to, these fathers. They're, the way they break down stories and really dig into them and see the Bible as a whole. And that takes me to my last thing. Okay. I'll say it very quickly. Now... This last thing here, I want you to do the sign of the cross on yourself and open your heart to understand. Because this is now the allegorical understanding of the Bible. So the fathers tell us the basic things that we learn in Sunday school. 
Then they take us a little bit deeper, which we learn in the sermons when, the, when, when we hear a sermon as adults. But then they go further, like some of the things we read today. And I, I promise you, if you go online and read the comparisons they do about Jairus and this lady, it will blow your mind away. Things I'd never read before or heard from anyone. But then there's a final level of biblical understanding, the allegorical level, that takes any story and sees in it something about Christ and the resurrection of our Christ and our salvation plan. Because the fathers teach us that the whole Bible is one story. It is the creation of man, the fall of man, and the salvation of man. That's the whole Bible from beginning to end. Okay? If you had to summarise it, that would be it. And some of the fathers have, have, in their commentaries have worked very hard to find that in any story in the Bible. Yabachtohum, as we say in Arabic. That they can have that depth of understanding. Now, it's not for everyone. And I thought long and hard about whether I should talk about this today. And I did ask someone, what do you think? And they encouraged me to do so. So if you don't, you can blame that person if you don't like it. You might walk away and say, really? And that's fine too, because we're all on a different journey. But I want you to open your hearts and see what you think. So the, a few of the fathers, so St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, um, and a, a few of the big names, all had different like versions. So I've tried to pull them together and give you what they see. So they see in the story of Jairus and this lady as an indication about Christ's mission on earth, okay? So this is what they say. Okay. So first of all, let's just rem remind you that Christ came to the Jews. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Christ came to the Jews and his mission was with the Jews. He didn't actually go out and... Um, actively preach the Gentiles. Are we all in agreement with that? There's nothing freaky about that. That's just facts in the Bible, yeah? Okay, so that was Christ's mission. So with that in mind, this is what they say. So they compare Jairus and the lady, Jairus and the lady. So I'm going to go through it that way. So they say Jairus represents the Jewish nation. Christ came to them because he went to his house. The lady represents the Gentiles. Christ didn't go to the Gentiles. We came to him, we, we, because we're Gentiles here, we came to Christ through the preaching of many disciples, just like the lady was the one who came to Christ. So they look at, you know what an allegory is, don't you? It's like a, an, an example or something that illustrates a picture, yeah? So they, they look at this story as something to illustrate Christ's mission in a different way, Okay. So Jairus, his daughter, represents the children of Israel who are dying because of their lack of understanding of the law and also because the law cannot save us. So they're dying because the law cannot save us. The lady has been ill for a long time and is getting worse because the Gentiles were sick due to their lack of morality and they were getting worse and if not healed would eventually die. Okay? Okay. Have I lost anyone? Okay. The synagogue represents the law. The ruler of the synagogue came at the feet of Christ begging for salvation for the children of Israel. That's his daughter, of course, right? She's the children of Israel. This shows the law is beneath Christ and can only come to the feet of Christ. The law cannot save. Okay? The lady, she came from behind. See how they break down the story? I love this. So She came from behind because Christ never preached among the Gentiles. He was never there among them. His mission was to come to the children of Israel. Now, it is known when a girl reaches puberty, it's usually around 12 years age, right? And if, if you all remember as young girls, we used to be allowed in the sanctuary until we turned 12 and then all of a sudden it was forbidden to us. But that was a reminder that at about 12, you reach puberty. This is an important thing. Okay, yes, sometimes we do things in church and we think, oh, what? But it's good to know why, where these things came from biblical stories to help us learn the Bible, okay? 
So it was known that the age of 12 was an age of maturity and um, girls could have babies at that time, okay? This is scientific fact. Girls can fall pregnant at 12, okay? So what does that mean? So, um, so the girl reaches, she's 12 years old, so she can bear children, so she's fruitful. So what the Christ is, what the father sees, the children of Israel had reached maturity and had all the tools, they had the law to produce fruit, but were not fruitful. Instead, they were dying because when Christ came, their understanding of the law was really, really pathetic. Okay, they had really, really stuffed up completely the correct understanding of the law. The girl had spent 12 years, uh, sorry, the lady had spent 12 years in ailments, a length of time when there should have been maturity, again, the, the number 12 meaning the maturity, but instead there was illness with no option for healing. But once healed, they are now fruitful. So once the Gentiles came to Christ, we became fruitful. We were dead before, but once we came to Christ, we became fruitful. Okay? Twelve years are symbolic of the twelve tribes. So for Jairus' daughter, twelve years, symbolic of the twelve tribes of Israel. So the whole Jewish nation. Uh, there's whole studies in the Bible about the numbers of the Bible. I hope one day you have lessons on those because they're amazing. And then the lady, 12 years are symbolic of the 12 princes of Ishmael in Genesis 17, 20 to represent the Gentiles. Note that both Ishmael and the tribes all came from Abraham. So we are all the children of God. Jews and Gentiles are all the children of God and God came for the healing of everybody. That's how they interpreted this story. I, I, Am I losing you or are you blown away? I, I was blown away by all this. So I, I'm seeing a lot of very deadpan faces. So I'm just a bit nervous that I've lost you. Anyway. Okay, Jairus. The resurrection, remember his daughter was resurrected, is the ultimate example of death being held at bay by faith. So we're holding death at bay by faith. So this is a foretaste of what is to come. For the lady, the stigma she feels because of her blood flow points to the stigma Christ will bear on the cross because Christ felt awful having all that sin sitting on him. So in summary, Jairus represent, is representative of the Jewish nation that Christ came for. Christ goes to his house to heal his daughter, which is the children of Israel. The lady is representative of the Gentiles who never saw Christ. They received their salvation through the disciples preaching the world. So she approaches from behind. She comes to Christ. He doesn't go to her. The fathers also teach that she touches the hem of Christ's garment because the Gentiles did not meet Christ during his mission. The garment, even the garment they focus on, is symbolic of the disciples who were the bridge between Christ and the Gentiles by taking the faith to the Gentiles. And I'm going to stop on that. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Sorry, I hope I didn't lose you. I hope it's something you've never heard before. If you thought it was all, a, you know, whatever, that's fine too. Okay? So um, there's a few nice quotes in here that I hope you'll read. There's a few other things in here that you'll read. I'm very conscious of the time, but we started late, so it's not my fault. Um, so <laughs> I have copies of this talk, word for word, what I said. As you can see, I was reading most of it because... They're big words and they're hard to remember. Please don't take one if you don't want one. Don't take one just to make me feel good. Personally, I, it doesn't worry me if people take one or not. And I also have some lollies. Now, I was supposed to come two weeks ago, so I had chocolates, but you guys moved the lesson, so now you've got smelly stuff. Sorry, mate. So I'll pass. Do you want to help me? Can you pass that to everyone? Gabriel, can you take the box for everyone? Or is that too heavy for me? Thank you, Beverly. Can you take it? Can you give them out? Thank you. I've got a nice little help. Any questions? No? Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We thank Phoebe. I don't know if you know, when you come to book Phoebe's time, if you're within two weeks of the talk, you don't bother because she refuses, and that's for good I reason. I refuse. I just give the person a hard time. She gives me a hard time, but that's, that's the, you know, <laughs> I, I, with Phoebe, she can give it to you. So, like, uh, it's better not to go there. <laughs> but the reason is she does a lot of research, and as you've seen today, she's gone into the depths and 
you find uh, an in-depth kind of study of of the Bible through the fathers, is, which is what we all kind of need. So we thank Phoebe because she puts a lot of effort into these talks. It's not just one night sit down and prepare everything. It, she takes weeks and weeks to to prepare this. So thank you, Phoebe, and that was great. I, I really enjoyed it, and and uh, I'll, I'll definitely take one of those pamphlets So for myself. Um, Guys, it's a real blessing to serve. It's a real honour. It really is. It is such an honour to serve, and we should never take preparing a lesson lightly. It is one of the best things you can do. I can't tell you how much I've learned that I wasn't able to share today because of time constraints. So you need to, to feel that. It isn't a nice occasion. So thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, also, I wanted to thank you guys. Um, I know we've been pushing on visitations in the last month or so. Um, we've improved and more children have visited, and, and that's great. And um, even, uh, I won't mention names, but there's, there were some servants who, um, who went to a, a far place and even slept over at, at this place, or not at the visitation, like in a hotel, so they can visit the child. So we, we appreciate that. And there's also servants who have never served, who have never um, visited anyone uh, and did visitations for the, for the first time. So that's a great thing. And we're still pushing for that goal of 100% visitation by the, end of, by the end of the year. So if you think you're going to struggle to reach that, let me know and we'll try to send in some reinforcements. But we appreciate your efforts and it's, it's, it's really good. I know the ones who've been for the first time got nervous, but they, they did well. Um, and many of the children especially the younger children, were visited for the first time by the church. And that's also important, okay? Um, that, the, that they feel the love of the church and the love of Christ coming to them. So we thank you for that. Um, do I have any questions or comments or anything? Okay, no questions. Then I'll give you back some time and we'll uh, ask Bona to pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, treasure of mercy, is bring your salvation. We come standing before you here, O Lord, as your faithful servants. We ask you, O Lord, to help us digest this wonderful talk that we just heard from our sister Phoebe regarding faith. And help it sink in, O Lord and be a practical application in our lives. Too many times, O oh Lord, in our busy lives, we do act like Jarius, and we come to you, Lord, only when there's a problem, but never when things are good. And when there's a problem, not only do we kneel down at your feet and beg for your mercy and help, but sometimes we're very specific in terms of what that help needs to look like. Very specific in terms of what the outcome needs to be. Very specific in when it needs to happen. Seems so much, O oh Lord, that it's on our terms, not yours. And that's our weakness sometimes in faith, O oh Lord, that propels us to have that relationship of need with you. And through your tender mercies and loving kindness, you still treat us as your children and entertain our needs, our desires, our wants, our asks, which are sometimes not requests, but sometimes mandates. We ask our Lord to help us realize this blessing of the story that we saw with this lady and the example of faith that she showed us. A faith, O oh Lord, that was pure. 
a faith that was blind. A faith, O Lord, that was just depending on you delivering an outcome without us having to even interrupt your path. And you still noticed her, O Lord, even though you were walking away from her. And as Phoebe said, she was behind you. She didn't ask. She didn't stop you. She didn't hold you. She didn't change the path that you were leading the crowd and leading her into. But all she did was, in faith, was to touch the hem of your garment. Help us, O Lord, to change our relationship with you, to be one of that blind faith, a total faith, O Lord, in that everything that you do and everything that you desire and everything that you manifest is according to your will for our sake, your children. Help us, O Lord, to have this belief in you and to have this relationship with you and to have this trust in you that even if we feel that you're not looking at us, that you're always in us and us in you. We ask you this through the intercessions of our mother, St. Mary, and the prayers of our hero, St. Mingna, and through the prayers of the hero, Marta, St. Mercurius of Isophane, whose feast we celebrate today. Hear us when we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one with them. And now the love of God the Father, the grace of the only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you.